the world. I, I, I live in, in the American continent and Mexico, it's a, it's a big country. And I live in Monterrey. It's an, a city that's in the northeastern part of the country. We are very close to the Texas border to the United States around an hour drive. And my city is a, it's a big city. We have, uh, well, not as big as the ones in India, of course. This is some pictures from my, my city. And uh, it's a very industrial part. We have a lot of mountains around and it's, it's very hot in, in the summer and it's cold in the winter. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. And I'm gonna show you for the, for the ones of you that haven't visited Mexico, I'm gonna show you a little video, okay? Okay, and well, for before we start, I, I would like to start with a, a little um, quote here. And I like this one very much, it's from Albert Einstein. It says that education is not learning effects, but training our mind to think. So now, right now that we have a lot of residents and orthodontists also, I, I, I always try to say to the, to the students, we must learn the, the most difficult part of, of orthodontics is learning to think, you know, to be ahead of what we're gonna work and, and possibly uh, planning our treatment. So this is, this is why this topic is very, very interesting right now. So I would like to begin with, uh, this is like a little dilemma that we have. Uh, this is a patient that came to my office and she, had, she was my patient a few years back. And the problem with this patient, she was 18 years old and she wanted veneers, you know, like uh, veneers and all, all her front teeth, but she has a very beautiful smile and she was very young. Right nowadays, there's a lot of patients or a lot of, pe a lot of people that seek, you know, aesthetic treatments. And a lot of the times they don't even need it. You know, they, they, they have a good occlusion, they have a healthy mouth. And sometimes there's a lot of doctors that also, you know, you know work or try to put a lot of aesthetic treatments in mouths that probably you can do a more conservative treatment. So the, 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 the question here is uh, what, what would be your treatment plan, you know, in these cases? Do you go for aesthetic treatment like veneers or you try to make some orthodontists or you try to do some a little bit more conservative treatment? So dentistry as a profession, it's been growing a lot in the past years and not all that growing is for good. We have, uh, we're going to like a little dark era where there's a lot of treatments that are, there's, we do around the world a lot of uh, disease-free procedures that probably you don't need to do them, okay? So uh, this is what, it's very important to understand why Smile Design, how can we use this tool for the benefit or, of our practice, okay? And so we're gonna, gonna talk, talk a little bit about aesthetics. We're gonna review some articles for the beginning. You know, uh, the concept of Smile Art that was uh, described by Dr. Sarver in 2001, uh, what it's it's very interesting because that what's help, that's what helped us you know to understand when we're talking about macro micro and mini aesthetics that the the smile arc is 
the curvature that we that our incisors you know develop uh, according to our lower lip okay in 2005 and the JCO Dr. Sabri was talking about the eight components of a balanced smile and here we have the concept of the lit line the smile arc the upper lip curvature we have the lateral ne negative spaces the symmetry and you know this is like a very uh, interesting uh, you know, a guide for aesthetics for our patients. We're talking about the dental, you know, the tipping of our, our the, of the teeth and also the gingival components and how they are, the gingival architecture, we can modify it or we can help modify it so it could, we have a more beautiful smile. This article is from 2014 from Dental Press from our friends from Brazil and from Dr. Wilson Machado. And he is talking about 10, 10 very important points that we have to review when we're talking about aesthetics. The first one is the smile arc, okay? And we can see here in the picture, we have we can have a, a convex curve that, that's ideally or more beautiful. You know, when you have the, uh, the incisal edges of our uh, that touch the line of the lower lip, we can have a plain or straight, you know, a smile arc. And sometimes us, we, we do that with the bracket placement. If we put the brackets almost in the same position, we're gonna have a flat, it's a smile arc, so we can help modify it with bracket position also. And one thing that's very common with the uh, wearing of the incisor ledges, sometimes we have an inverted smile arc. So here we have a patient, when she finished the treatment, she had shortened her crown because of, of wearing. So after the ortho treatment, she did some veneers and we can see how the teeth are more longer, they're more square, and we have a, a more balanced smile curve but that's done with a combination of restorative dentistry you know, at the end of the treatment. And we can modify this also. Here we have a patient, she was 13 years old at the beginning. So we, we did some, uh, some restorations on the, on the frontal teeth and also our bracket placement was more gingival and that helped us at the end you know, to, to position or, or show more her smile arc. So that's what we can do to modify it to help our patients. Here we have a patient that's a younger patient. So with bracket positioning, we can we can help do that. And one of the and, and one uh, factor that's very important are also the the size of the teeth. You know, uh, when we have normally we all, always our lateral incisors are more smaller than the centrals, and that you know that that proportion. If we have you know like the incisor ledges with a little bit, uh, I know a millimeter or a millimeter and a half that helps us to, to mark more or to show more of the smile arc, to contour the sign. Here we have a patient that has, you know, more balanced or, or bigger laterals. So it shows, you know, more evenly, but we have also patients that have smaller laterals and it's, it's marked a little bit more. So it's very important to understand that in, in aesthetics, it has a, and it's, you know, we, we have a high, uh, percentage of people that have smaller laterals. So it's very important for us to diagnose that at the beginning. And, you know, if we need to leave space for uh, restoration at the end of the treatment, that's what we should do. Okay, also the proportion between the teeth, you know, we have the golden radio that's 62% from central lateral and canine. And we have now a modified radio where um, it's better to show more teeth. You know, so we have, have a wider smile. This is the example of the proportion of the teeth. We have the small, small lateral incisors. So sometimes the patient doesn't even, uh, when he sees, you know, when, when the patient goes to our practice and they say that they don't like their teeth, sometimes they don't even know why. But we, when, when you see a patient like this, you, we understand fully that it's a, a tooth size. So we open up spaces so this patient have, can have restorations. Okay, this is another patient that has more proportionate T size, so you look at a more balanced or more wider smile. Okay. Also, you know the the relationship of the radio between um, width and height of the teeth. So that's very important. We have a a, a very short tooth. It's it's over um, 85 percent. So the normal size we're going to be talking about seventy five and eighty five percent of width with the height with the uh, you know the the gingival incisal uh, distance. And a lot of times we have spaces also in the in the in the upper part in the lateral position, and that's um, that's very common when we have like uh, smaller laterals. So that's why we must leave the space so we can have restorations at the end. Like in this case, this patient she had a very small lateral incisor in the left part. We can see it, so we plan to 
to put the teeth in a certain position so at the end she can have her restoration. And this is, you know, the evolution of the treatment. She, she had a previous uh, ortho treatment, but when you have smaller teeth, the tendency is always to close spaces. So she had the canines in class two. So what we did in the treatment, we put the canines back in class one and we left the space so she can have a restorative treatment at the end. Okay, our, now, and when we talk about um, the gum uh, margin or gingival mice margin, Normally, we, we always, you know, have the lateral and the central and the canine at the same height. And the lateral is about a millimeter or two lower from that, the margin. But with, with a lot of the tendency right now, having more bigger teeth, sometimes our restorative colleagues leave the marginal ridges at the same height. And we can see here a treatment when we have unbalanced margin, gingival margins. At the end, it's very important to, to do that contouring or gingivectomy so our teeth look more balanced in a bigger and in, in a bigger way now uh, a lot of the times we must diagnose this uh, very it's very important to do the di diagnosis before doing the treatment because sometimes we need to do a, um, a crown lengthening and we need to send it to our colleague the periodontist or the surgeon so they can do an histotomy first you know do the the flap get bone out and then suture that and and sometimes we can do a small gingivectomy but uh, when we need to do an histotomy, we need to refer to our, our colleagues, okay? Now, the exposure of the teeth, you know, sometimes we have a very high smile that we show a little bit of gum. If you have a, a younger patient, that's okay because uh, we know that uh, when we get older, our lip goes down, you know, our, our lip line is gonna be shown less uh, in the more older we are. So we can have a medium smile that you show, you know, about eight, 75, 100% uh, uh, of the crown. And we, some, in some patients, we have a very low smile. Now, in, if you have a young patient, if we do some bracket positioning, uh, we, we, we do our, uh, like um, more gingival, the bracket positioning, it gonna be, it's gonna show more our, uh, you know, our, our smile arc there. Now, here we have three patients, different, different situations. On the left, we have a very high smile. You know, at the middle, we have a medium, and at the right, we have a very low smile. So it's gonna be different procedures that we're gonna do with the patients. Now, sometimes it's very important to understand that when we have a high smile, it could be because they're showing a lot of the lips. You know, we have a very short upper lip. And sometimes we, we misdiagnose that, we, we, we do a mixed diagnosis, and we try to, you know, like refer the patient for a surgical impactation. But a lot of the times it's that the, the, the upper lip is very short. So it's very important to do a correct diagnosis on these patients. And we're talking about the buccal corridors, you know, the, the negative, negative spaces. It's very common after uh, extraction treatment that we have a very a narrow arch. So in, um, in a lot of the, you know, like the self ligating brackets, the systems, what we, what we look, there's not to do an expansion, but do a, uh, you know, art and arch development, you know, transverse arch development, and that helps us to be, do a broader smile, a more uh, broader and beautiful smile. Like in this case, at the beginning, she was, had a very narrow smile, and at the end, she had a more broad smile. It's also some, that's very important, the, to, the teeth angulation, or we can have sometimes a uh, symmetry of the occlusal plane, and in, in this case as well, we can use uh, mini implants or, or skeletal anchorage so we can you know, level that arch symmetry. The teeth angulation is very important. You know, with, with brackets, we can put the, te the teeth in a proper position or more aesthetic position. And, and we do that with, with orthodontics. And another important thing is the teeth size and, and color. Sometimes we're gonna be, we're gonna have very smaller teeth because that's uh, how they genetically that's how they develop genetically, or we can have a small teeth also because of the wearing. So in those cases, we just need to position our, our teeth in a, in a better position and then do the restorations, okay? And um, a lot of times with the position of our teeth, we can, we can do a better, you know, dip, lip um, volume. A lot, right now, a lot of patients, well, I don't know whether they're in India, but here in Mexico, and, and the United States, a lot of the patients go and inject themselves you know, uh, on the lips so they can have you know, more uh, wider lips. So um, in this case, we, we just positioned better the teeth so she was showing them a little bit more volume on the lips. You're talking about fillers or Botox? Uh, fillers, yes, they lose a lot of fillers also here. 
and 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 sometimes they don't even need them. But we can if we can position better our our incisors, we can help uh, to show more volume of, in the in the lips. Okay. So th that's a very interesting article. I recommend you to, to study it. Now we're going to talk a little bit about smile design. W what is it? You know, what, what, it, what is smile design? How is it done? How we can do it? And how we can do this for our ortho patients in our planning. Now, this concept of smile design was created by Dr. Christine Coachman from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it was uh, at the first he did it so we can have a uh, multidisciplinary communication tool. You know, if, if you wanted to plan like a restoration, and they needed to you know specifically, uh, you know, to talk with the technician that was going to do the veneers. So they did like um, um, a wax up, you know, like a, a model, and they and they show that to the dental technician. And then you, with that planning, you can talk with the perio specialist, with the ortho specialist, and you can have a better communication of what is that you're looking for. So this is a very interesting tool that we can do. And it's, we have a lot of templates, you know, it, the, the concept of smile design is doing some templates, putting them on photographs of our patients, and we can use for this PowerPoint, Keynote, depends on the, the, the computer that you have, and we can place them on the pictures and we can simulate or we can uh, try to understand how, how we can do a better smile for our patients. We have these templates of, of teeth size, of two size, of proportion, and these tools, we put them on the, over the, the photograph and, and it's a more visual way for us to understand what's wrong or what we want to work with, okay? Also the lip line is very important because in a lot of the patients we're gonna have an S, a, a, not a, a very symmetric uh, lip and we, it's important for us to understand it. Now we can do this with the DSD app, the application that's from uh, DSD. We can do it in PowerPoint Keynote a smile design, you can even do it with Invisalign, with a clean check or with digital orthodontics also. Now, in, in Dr. Coachman's uh, Instagram, he put that the digital smile design are two things, the concept and the company. The concept, we, everyone, everybody, we can all use it. You know, if you have a computer and a photograph of your patient, you can do it in your house, in, in your office. But also the company has the tools that help you to do this more, more easily. And one, in one lecture, Dr. Coachman was saying that the, the more or the better smile designers we are, it, we, we understand more the benefits of ortho treatment for our patients. Uh, we need to move teeth to put them in a better position. And at the end, we can do the restorations, okay? It's very important for, for our colleagues, our, our restorative um, colleagues to, to understand that it's, it's gonna be more, it's gonna be easier for them to do our treatment and it's, we're gonna be more a conservative treatment with our patients. We put brackets first, position our teeth, and then do the restorative treatment. Okay, this is another picture of my seating. And um, before we start with the cases, this is a, a quote that I like very much, that's, uh, that uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Sometimes in ortho, we just put the brackets on, we start changing the wires, and we wish for the teeth to move in a, in a certain position. But if we have a goal and we establish a treatment plan, it's going to be more easier for us. So we're going to start with a case. This is going to this is a, a, a patient, a 40-year-old patient, female patient. She had already two ortho treatments, and she comes to the office. She have she has some composite restorations on the front teeth, and if we start seeing this now, it looks very symmetrical. We can see an um, her lip on the right side. It's more. It's it, is not, she doesn't have a very symmetrical smile. So we have an asymmetrical lip. So on the right side, she's a little bit more gums than on the left side. And if we see there, she has a smaller lateral on the right than on the left. So that's why it looks like a little bit, um, you know, like if, if you had a canted occlusal plane. If we look in the intro pictures, we can see that the upper arch is it's relatively well aligned but the lower arch has the lateral incisor off, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's vestibular, it's buccal position. So if we take this picture, we can see how the incisal edges of the lower incisor, well, the edges of the lower incisor are a little bit wearied out and we have the lateral that's misplaced. So this patient, she wanted to have veneers on the upper and also in the lower. But we talked to the patient, we said, well, we're gonna do you um, like a, a smile design. We're gonna do a mock-up so you can see how your teeth 
are going to look. Now, this is very important because if, if we do like this uh, simulation, we put the markup on the teeth, the patient sees or sees before uh, how her treatment is going to end. And, and that's a very good way for, uh, for our patients to, to understand what we're trying to do or, or our treatment plan. And also, it's like the emotional part. When she sees a better, a better smile, she says she's going to go for a treatment. Okay. So this is her lateral uh, radiograph or panoramic radiograph. She's missing a, a second molar. She has a graft there for the implant. So what we did here, we started doing the mock-up. Now we have, this is the, the this picture is, it's taken, it's an controller picture, but it's uh, angulated like eight degrees. We don't take it, you know, normally when we take a, a, a ortho photograph of our patient, we're trying to do it parallel to the tussle plane. In this case, we tried to, we angle it a little bit, the camera, and we put, we put a contrast, a black or other, other contrast, so we can have this image. And this picture is the one that we're going to work with. Now, um, we don't have a lot of time to, to, to show you exactly how, is, how do we do it you know, with, the, with the keynote. But in a very general way, the, the white line that, that we see there, it's like uh, the intrapopular line. We transport it to the mouth of the patient, over, over pose, or over posing, over in positioning the pictures. And we can see the distance, the different distance that we have from the marginal ridges to that plane. So we can see that it's, it's very, you know, um, it's not that off, it's not that irregular. And we start using the template. So we can see a, an ideal proportion of the tooth is 80%, like we see here. So we place this template on the incisors. We see that we need about a millimeter or two more lengthening of, a, of the centrals. Now, it depends on the case, but that lengthening of the teeth, you can do it if you do a gingivectomy or you can do a lengthening of the crown with uh, restoration. We have a, a, a fairly proportionate, you know, canine to canine uh, relationship. So we get the templates and we overimpose them on the teeth. And, and, and for this, we have different shapes of tooth. You have a more square teeth, we have triangular teeth. In this, in this case, we have a little bit more uh, like um, uh, rounded teeth. So uh, with this simulation, we talk to a technician and we tell them we, that we want a wax up. We want a simulation of how this can finish. Now with the wax up, we, we do with a silicone, we have a key, you know, like a, a guide, and we put some resin on it. It's a bisacryl resin, and we put it over the teeth. That's what we call a mock-up. You do this with the wax up, you know, that, that that's with our colleagues. We, Obviously I don't do this because that's not my, my area. But once we do it, we put in the patient and we take some pictures and we can simulate or we can see how her, her smile can be better. Now, if we compare on the left side is when she got in the, the office, on the right side is when she has a wax up there, the, the mock-up, sorry. And we can see the difference how now the teeth are more uh, symmetrical. We can see a better uh, smile arc so when the patient sees her photographs, she says, I want to do a treatment. But in this case, we, we condition her, the treatment that if you want veneers on the upper, on your upper teeth, you need to use brackets on the lower teeth so we can align them and you can have a more conservative treatment. Okay. So this is the mock-up. You can see how beautiful it looks to smile. And this is how she got there. And we have the, the mock-up on the lower. Okay, now she started the treatment in March. Uh, prior to starting, she did, we, we need to, we send her to do some gingivectomy and then we place the brackets. We only place brackets in the lower. Now you can see these are um, self ligating brackets, uh, Damon Clear. We start with a regular 0 by 14 uh, copper nitride wire. And by May, when we had already aligned the lower arch, she, they, we did the, the veneers on the upper part from five for five. Now in the upper picture, you can see the mock-up. That was our, our plan. And in the lower, we can see now the, the veneers from five for five put in, in the mouth of the patient. They're practically the same. And that's why it's very important to plan this. So you can send it with our, our colleague from Perio so, she, so they can do a correct uh, gingivectomy. And in the lower part, 
the restorative dentist will knew exactly what, what we wanted on the proportion of the lower of the teeth. Now we have the veneers and the brackets on. So uh, the patient was very happy because she can see herself a more beautiful smile here. And the only thing we, that we need to do is just finish the case. It was a very, very simple ortho case, but with the combination of treatments, well, our patient was very happy. So we can see it's very fairly aligned. She's only had about uh, three months in treatment. By August, we were already now in a, a 19 by 25 TMA wire, doing some uh, first order bends just to finish. You can see now the lower uh, teeth, they have the marginal ridges aligned. And we, at the end, we were gonna do some, some um, uh, composite restorations of the lower, trying to do it very conservative. So this is our smile. And in October, we started in March, by October, this is the day that we took out the brackets. You can see now it's very aligned. It looks much, much better. She has uh, the gum, a, a little bit of uh, irritation there. It's, it's a little swollen sol because of the, when you use that, the Damon brackets, the Damon clear, they're very wide brackets. And in some of the patients, we can find this uh, inflammation on the lower. So that's the day we took the brackets off. So we can see the, the teeth how they look very good. And she has a very beautiful smile. It's, it's not a very difficult case, but we need to do this combination of treatments so our patients are more satisfied with, with the results. And if they're satisfied, they're gonna recommend this to, to other, for more patients, okay? So this is the initial and the end. The final, this is the, the smile picture. And here we can see what was our, our prediction, the mock-up that we had at the beginning and how we finished the case. And you can see that's very similar. So the, we, the objective of the treatment was, was we, we did the, the objectives that we traced, okay? Now, uh, this is, uh, a, that, that was a, a more restorative case. Now we're gonna talk about how we can use this for our orthodontic patients, okay? So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit now how we can um, plan our bracket or place in our brackets so we can have a better smile here in this kind of treatment. Here we have another patient, his name is Luis. He is a 34 year old male. And this is from August, 2018. And when he comes to the office, we can see that when he smiles, he has a very worn upper incisor. And he also has a very asymmetric man mandible. It's like it's asymmetric to the right. And if we see the, the, the intro pictures, we can see he, he has a class one canine and molar but he has a excessively worn um, upper incisors. Now, if we look at the lower arch form, it's, it's uh, asymmetric. We have, a, it's, a, it's a very, um, you know, like to the left, it's, it's a little bit because of the mandible that's asymmetric. So th I, that's why I believe that he has that worn of the teeth. He thought that he had a very crooked teeth, but we can see that they're not that crooked. They're more worn. We can see the overbite pictures, how he has a very, very severe warring of the, of the upper teeth. So this is the, our situation. Now we decided here for planning on the, and what we wanted to, to do for this treatment, we did a, a wax up. We also did a mock-up for the patient so he can see uh, how the treatment or what was our, 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 our objectives on the treatment, okay? So this is a contrast picture. And we start measuring the teeth. So if you see from the right to left, we have a canted occlusal, uh, the, the margins are canted, you know, the, to the left. So this is because of the warning of the teeth. That's why we have that. So we plan, you know, how we want or the size of the teeth, how we want to shape them. And we do the mock-up. Here we have the model. And here's the wax up. And uh, in this particular case, we were, we were gonna work on the four incisors and then the left canine, that's very warm. So we have here the initial photograph on, on, the, le on the left, in the middle, we have an over position on what are the patient's initial and of the mock-up. And you can see that really what he needs is a restorative treatment. Of course, we need to, uh, you know, to, to align and level our teeth but it's gonna be more a restorative case. So this is with the mock-up in place. And we take the patient some pictures with the mock-up and he sees that he has a, a more beautiful smile. 
in, in that moment, the patient says, I want the treatment. So we're gonna place the brackets. And this is the initial bracket placement. And you can see our first objective is gonna level the, the marginal ridges of, a, of a, what we want, no, the, the, the gingival contour, we want to level it so we can have some restoration there. Now, how we're gonna place the brackets. And for this particular, I'm gonna to talk to you about three articles. Um, the first one uh, is uh, of, we, the first thing that we need to do when, we when, we're, when we're gonna work with smile design, we need to understand what's the real or what's the proper size of the teeth, okay? I'm gonna to talk to you about that and how we're gonna position the brackets to, 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 to do a smile art protection or to uh, display more of the incisors. That's in the middle article from Dr. Tom Pitts. And on the right side, we have a, uh, an article from uh, my friend and teacher, Dr. Balut, probably you know him. And it's about how we're gonna do the bracket placement depending on the aesthetic of the smile. Now, the first thing we, that we need to do is to measure the teeth and calculate what's gonna be the ideal size. Now, this is from this article. It's from doc, it's 2016 from the AJO. This is from Dr. Germán and Dr. Stephen Shu. I'm sure you've heard of him. And Dr. Shu has this, uh, th this um, you know, like, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it, it's this, this, uh, this figure, okay? If you want to calculate what's the ideal size of the teeth, if we don't have, uh, if you have two, your, your upper teeth are too worn, you calculate it from the lower incisor, okay? Always, it's going to, the, the lower incisor is going to be, the central lower incisor is the teeth that's going to have the more, um, we can call it like the more uh, standard size. And the upper central incisor is going to, is going to measure three millimeters more in, in width, okay, from the, uh, from the central incisor. And the la upper lateral is going to be two millimeters more smaller than the central, and the canine is going to be one millimeter smaller than our central incisor. Now we know that you need to do a bolt-on analysis, but when we do a bolt-on study, we we always you know like we we talk in percentages and we say well we have a more we have more uh, tooth uh, on the upper end and the lower, but with this table with this table we can. Uh, no, it's more easier for us to calculate the, 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 the ideal size of the teeth. Now, this is very important when, we're gonna, when we want to talk with our restorative colleagues. So uh, the first thing that we need to do is to measure the teeth. And this is what we do in the model. We're going to measure the, the lower incisors. We're going to measure the width of the upper uh, incisors and the, the length, okay? Now, once we have measured the teeth, this is a table from the article. We can see that our incisors, uh, the width of the incisors are eight millimeters. So in this table, if you see on the upper part, when eight millimeters are, and then you can see this is a, um, an average size that the, it, it, the ideal length of the tooth is 10.3 millimeters. And if we have an 8.5 uh, wide incisor, then the, the ideal length of the teeth is gonna be 11. If we have more wider of nine millimeters central, then it's going to it's going to be a, a larger or more longer tooth, 11.5 or 12 millimeters. So this is very easy. So this table you can do it, and you can send it with our with our um, with our colleagues. Now, in this case, if we have a central that that measures eight millimeters, and you have a lateral that measures five. Well, then you know that you need to do a six millimeter space so they can do some restorative treatment there. In the case of the lateral incisor. So once we calculate the, the ideal tooth size, we want, we want to see, uh, like Dr. Pitts, uh, he talks a lot about you know, positioning the brackets more gingivally so you can, you can show more the, the smile line. Now, one thing that's very important that Dr. Pitts does, and he's, he's an excellent ortho, what he does here, he also lengthens the teeth. If you, have, you, know, if you see these cases, we're gonna have very long teeth, we're gonna have a, a gum recontouring, and that's very important. So, the, so our, our smiles look more beautiful at the end of the treatment. So that's, he, he plans very good that, that um, you know, lengthening the teeth. So they have, the patient have a more beautiful, uh, showing more uh, uh, incisor display, you know, when show more incisor and he has a very good finishes there. And at the end, what we're gonna do, we're gonna subtract the ideal so we can do the, the correct bracket placement. Now, I, I use this table of, of bracket placement from Dr. Uh, Nasib, 
And um, in this table, uh, this is from JCO, uh, this was uh, an article from last year in the JCO. And when we have a low, uh, you know, a low um, smile display, we, you put the brackets more gingerly. If you have an average one, we put it more in the center, about six millimeters. And we, if we have a high smile line, well, we can put them at the nor an average of five millimeters. Uh, generally, the lower arch is gonna be the same size. The only, um, the only variable that we're gonna have in the lower arch positioning is if we have an open mouth or, or yes, we have an open bite, well, we can put a little, a little bit more gingival, the brackets on the lower, so it, it extrudes a little bit more easier. We can close better the bite. Okay, so this is gonna be a little example of how we do this on our patients. This is a, a patient that we have a little bit worn on the upper teeth. So the first thing that we're gonna do, we're gonna measure the width of the teeth, okay? Now, in this case, it's eight millimeters. So if we have an eight millimeter width, um, no, um, mesodistal distance of the tooth, and our real um, length is 8.5. So we're talking that that's almost the same proportion. So the ideal size of this teeth is gonna be 10 millimeters. So if we plan on placing our bracket, for example, on six millimeters height, or, or the, the, the height we're gonna do, we're gonna um, subtract, we have 10 millimeters of our, our, our deal two size, we're gonna uh, subtract the 8.5, that's the real uh, size of the of length of the, of, the, of the incisor. So we're gonna have a, a 1.5 discrepancy. Now, if, if we wanna put our bracket on six millimeters, we subtract the 1.5 of the discrepancy that we have with the ideal size of the teeth, and we're gonna place the bracket at 4.5, okay? I hope I explained it easily, but it's very simple. Once you understand or once you plan the height you want, we have the, the ideal size. So we put the brackets on those positions. So when we place the brackets, it's gonna look a little bit like this. We start leveling and we start aligning the teeth. And we have to tell our patients that they're gonna look worse, okay? When we start aligning, we're gonna have our, uh, our margins are gonna uh, level but uh, the incisor ledges are gonna be more off. So in this moment, what we can do is a little bit uh, restore the treatment and we can visualize better our treatment, how we're gonna work, okay? So at the end, we have a correct length of the teeth. So we're gonna see what happened with this patient. This is how we place the teeth. And once we, uh, uh, two months later, we have our marginal, our marginal gingival margins more aligned. So we send it to the restorative uh, uh, doctor and they did some, some composite uh, uh, restorations there. Now, uh, ideally, when we do this, uh, you can do it with, if you're working with metal brackets, you could take the brackets off, sandblast them, then put them back on. In this case, we're working with aesthetic brackets. So we, we don't want to, you know, the less that we, the, the, the less that we, the, the bond of brackets is gonna be better. So we had enough size so they can do this, this provisional restorations and this is how it looks. Now uh, at the, be this, you can do it before you put the brackets because, but because of, the, of, of his bite that was very worn, we first have to, we first needed to level a little bit the, the upper incisors and then we did the, the restorations. So this is the advance of the case. It, we, we can see the, the asymmetric, you know, uh, on the right side, but we're working now. It's more easy for us to work like this. And if you have this uh, provisional restorations, well, the patient, he, he, he has a better self-esteem because the teeth look better. Okay. He had a little bit of inflammation of the gums, but we can see now it's a more easier treatment that we're doing. You can see here how the teeth were changing color and now the, the composites were, the difference of the, of the tooth colors were more, it's more obvious here. So this was the treatment. We needed to close some space on the upper, but we have a more aligned upper and lower arch now. We're, our, we're working here now in, with our rectangular wires. Now, uh, this is a year later from that. We took off the brackets. It was just, you know, like past month, just, slightly when the, the lockdown occurred. So I took this patient's bracket off. And you can see he has a better smile. He has this asymmetric, you know, mandible to the right. But this is when we finished the treatment. Now, um, 
the suggestion for this patient was to do some is to do some uh, a restorative treatment on the from canine to canine. You can see the canine on the left that's very worn off. We need to change the 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 composites on the upper incisors, but we can see how our treatment was very uh, successful. We can see the midline, the the over general right. It's important here to do a very thick, you know, incisal edge, so we have better protection of the incisal guide there. We can see a little bit canted on the lower arch because of the asymmetry, but we can see that's a fairly, you know, it was easier once we did the bracket positioning. This patient needs some restorative treatment. You can see between the lateral and the canine on the right side, we have a little space there. And on the left, the canine is very worn off. But we have our, our lower fixed retainer from canine to canine. And on you know, the upper, what we do is a wraparound, a regular retainer. But we can see here for what was the initial situation once we did the mock-up and our final treatment. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, this treatment, uh, restorative treatment, just needs you know like the veneers. But we can see that it looks very good right here. And we're going to be decent. We're going to compare the, the initial photographs and the final ones. We can see how now we have a better length of the teeth. We have better position of them. And it's very important. So this, he's a relatively young patient. He does, he, he, he didn't, it wasn't not uh, good to have that worn on the teeth. So it was important to fix this before it get, got worse. And you can see it's class one the same. It's not a very difficult case. It was just a treatment of, of aligning and, and planning in what position we wanted to put the incisors, okay? This is the initial and the end of the treatment. Okay, that's with the mock-up. So we can see that's very similar on the planning that we had on, on the beginning. Okay, now this is gonna be, this is another patient. She's a young 23 year old uh, female patient. She came to our office. She already had two ortho treatments. And the first thing that she told me said, doctor, I don't like my smile. I don't know what I have, but I don't like my smile. So when we saw the patient, when we see it at the beginning, well, we can see that she has very short teeth and she has, she, she shows more gingival tissue on the left than on the right. So when I started to, to see the, the pictures, we can see here how retrocline, she has very um, retrocline upper incisors. And she has a good lip volume, very Latina. Okay, and, and when we see the pictures, we can see sh how she has very worn the, the upper incisors. She has a, a deep overbite. And, and if we start analyzing the teeth size, we can see that she has a very unproportionate, you know, the ideal size is 80 in height and width, and she had a very short teeth. So the, pro so the problem in, in her case was that she had a very worn incisors and the bracket placement, I, I think on the first case, they put them all on the same uh, level, the brackets, and they just put power chains and they retrocline all the teeth. And, and because of the overbite, she was wearing them off a lot. So this is the initial case. And this is, uh, we start like uh, planning how the size or how we want to position this teeth. And once we, we, we establish what's the ideal size of the tooth that I want, then we calculate the bracket position that we want to put there. Her incisors were eight millimeters wide. So this is how we, we analyze putting her brackets. So we started with positioning the brackets and once we started with the treatment, we were already leveling and aligning and we can see now how we have the marginal ridges of the gingival marginal ridges are now more aligned, but we have the, the incisor edges now there that we can see the discrepancy that we have there. She used of the overbite, we put some turbo bites on the upper incisors so we can have a, a protection of the, the bite. And once we did that, we're gonna send our patient to do some, some restorations on the upper incisors. Now you can see the difference that it looks now, it looks much more better. And the patient, she likes more her teeth and we can work more easily. Okay. 
Okay, you can see now the position of the incisors. But uh, if we take pictures of the smile, we can see that she still has it a little bit more canted on the, on the left side. So we decided to put some um, skeletal anchorage. In the first part, we plan to put in an, a mini implant on the, on the anterior teeth and on the, the premolars. But in this case, we only had to put them on the anterior. So I'm gonna show you, this is the, 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 when we put the mini implant, this little video. It's, it's very easy. Once you understand uh, the correct uh, anatomical um, landmarks that we need to use to position the, the mini implants, it's more easy. I use a, a big, uh, you can see there, it's a big uh, mirror. And I use this for, for bracket placement and also when I put a mini implant. And uh, if you don't have a big mirror, you can use a mirror that you use for photographs also. And it's important because you're, you're, if you look from the occlusal view, you can see the angulation of the teeth so you don't, so you can put more um, interdentally. It's very, here you can see we're using a, a vector TAS a mini implant. It's eight by 1.4 millimeters. It's 1.4 millimeters of diameter. It's a very, very thin mini implant. And you can see, you know, if, if we look at, at the video, it looks at like it's very high, you know, like we're, we're doing it in the muckle gingival line. So we can put it on, on uh, so we don't have it on mobile uh, mucosa there. You can see it's very easy and it's important. So, so if you look right, just a little bit in the mirror, how the angulation of the mini implant is placed. Okay. Now with this mirror, the, the advantage is that we can see more or we can see better the angulation that we're placing the brackets. You can see there, and we're putting it exactly in the middle of the lateral and the canine. So it's, it needs to be a little bit more angulated. We can't put it, uh, you know, like straight there. You have to angulate it because of the arch form, okay? Once we put the mini implant, we have to take, take a radiograph so we can see how, if we're not uh, touching the, the, the roots of the teeth and we're gonna start to activate the intrusion. Now, we're, if you see there, we have a power chain. It's very lightly, uh, you know, um, activated. We, we don't want to activate more than two ounces. 60 grams is enough. It, we need very, very little force to do this. If we overpower or we put more force or, or you know, to the, to the elastic chain, it's very probable that we're gonna lose the mini implant. So this is a radiographic check. We can see that we're not touching the, the, the roots. That's why we need a very a small or, or diameter size implant there. So we activate it. We put an aesthetic ligature you know, between the incisors, because if we, if we don't put a ligature, our incisors are gonna start flaring to the uh, to, uh, to, to buccal and we're gonna start opening space. So it's very important to maintain the, the ligature on our incisors. Okay, so we start the intrusion on the left side. Now it's very important what I do, I, also, I always measure uh, the distance between the implant and the arch, okay? So this is, here we have the, the evolution. December was when we put the mini implant and in December, the, the distance between the mini implant and the, and the arch was 13 millimeters. In January, it was 12.5. In February, it was 12. And in April, it was 10 millimeters. So we had a, a shortening of that distance of three millimeters in approximately four months. Okay, now what happened here? Did they intrude or what happened to the teeth? Now, I'm gonna show you in a little bit what happened there. So after we do the active intrusion, we're gonna have a, a direct anchorage there. Now, then I'm what I'm gonna do, look at the position of the incisors. It looks much, 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 much better. So after that, we were doing the active intrusion with the power chain. Now we use a ligature from the mini implant to the arch so we can do um, an in, uh, like an indirect anchorage there because when we intruded that side, we, we created an open bite on the left. So we, we, want, we put the mini implant, so we have a, an anchorage on, on the left side. And then we, use, we asked the patient to use elastics so we can close the bite on the left side because of the open bite that we created by intruding the, that part, okay? Now we use uh, the mini implant. We're, what we did there, it's a, a, meta, it's a metallic ligature. And we put a little bit, uh, when we tied it up, in the arch, we put a little bit of uh, fluid resin there, so it doesn't uh, cut, you know, the the patient. So it's more um, comfortable, 
and we're using some elastics there to close the bite. It's 3 16th, 3.5 ounces elastics there. And in the, in, the, in the left side, we can see what was the initial angulation of the teeth. And we can see now on the right, on the right side, the difference of the angulation that we did. Now, um, what happened here? We must understand that when we're talking about uh, biomechanics and, and we have different options for our teeth to move and it's relative to the center of resistance of the root. But um, it's very important to see what any movement that we do, it's gonna, it, it's not gonna be like we, we usually, they teach us that, you know, the, the arrow on the crown of the teeth and it moves. Really what the, the problem here, or what we must understand is it depends on the position of the bracket. So in this case, we have the bracket on front of the center of resistance. And, and if we put a mini implant and we put a chain to upright that teeth, this is what happens, okay? Every time you try to, to, to upright the teeth, we're gonna have a, a, a buccal angulation of the tooth. And this is what happened in our patient. It didn't really intrude those four, three millimeters. What happened was the, the crown changed the angulation and the distance from the mini implant and the arch changed. But that was what I wanted so we can level a little bit more the occlusal plane and to change the angulation of the incisors. If we do it in extrusion, you know, well, like if you're pulling down the teeth, this is what's gonna happen. If we put some, for example, if you're in a two by four and you put some open coils on, on your lateral spaces, this is what happens if we don't uh, control the position of the anterior brackets. And in treatments where we do extractions that we do a, a retraction um, mechanics, that's what rich on clients or what uh, changes the, the angulation of our upper teeth. So it's very important so we can you know, figure this and that's what happened in this case. Now we can see from the beginning and how we ha the, her occlusal plane changed because of the, of the mini implant and also because of the uh, lengthening of the crowns of the teeth. So in November, we took the brackets off and she did a gingivectomy. She did some uh, resin restorations. The patient was very young. She, she wanted some veneers but we, we advised her to, you know, to wait a little bit because she had, a very, she had a more beautiful smile. Now we can see, now we finished the treatment, we have the proper size of the teeth, we have, they have the proper position, how it changes, and the, but um, the angulation of the incisors, that's very important here. I always use the fixed retainer on the lower from two to three, and we can see the difference from the beginning and what we have on the end. She still, she still has, uh, some scarring tissue from the gingivectomy. But you can see the angulation of the teeth, how it changed, you know, have a better overbite. She has better uh, canine lateral movements. And aesthetically, it looks more beautiful this month. So if we plan, the position of the bracket is gonna help us a lot for our, our planning or, this, or what we want to do at the end of the treatment. This is another picture of my city. That's a mountain that we have here in Monterey. And uh, this is the last case. Uh, this is a 26-year-old female patient. She comes to the office and she has a, 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 a like a post smile on the left, and she has a more you know more social smile on on the right. And, and if we analyze her smile, she has a smile. She has a high smile. Okay, she shows a little bit more of, of gum tissue. She has a negative buccal spaces. You can see her triangular arch form. You know, it's very narrow. And she has a disproportion of the two sides on the, on the, on the anterior teeth, okay? So she has a, a correct upper lip line and a, a fairly good smile art. And from the canines and the incisors, we can see that the, the edges and incisal edges of, of the incisors and the canines, they touch the lower lip. So that's a fair good smile line that we have there, the smile art. Now, if we see she has an open bite on the interior, she's a, a class three tendency and she has, uh, she has, she shows a lot of incisor. Now, in this case, I can't extrude the incisors because if I extrude them or I position my brackets more gingival, she's gonna show more uh, gum tissue. So what, I, what, what in this case, our plan was to intrude the posterior part of the teeth to level the occlusal plane. She has two occlusal planes, a back and an anterior one. 
Here we have the panoramic X-ray, and here are the, the, the lateral, the Ceph. And if we look at the intro pictures, we can see that she has a midline deviation, about a millimeter and a half to the right. Okay, she, and now she has a very narrow upper arch. So if when we have patients with a narrow upper arch, the lower is it's always gonna be more contracted or, or, or we have a more constrained, more narrow arch in the lower also. She has some teeth and crossbite, the, the lateral incisors, edge to edge anterior relationship. And on the right, it's class one molar and class one canine. On the left, we have a class three molar and canine. And we can see the, the narrow and the triangular arch form. Okay, now in five months in treatment, we, we start with, a, uh, when we work with self like in brackets, what we want to do is do a transverse development. Okay, we, so we start putting our arches, we start, it's not an expansion. We, what, we, what we're doing is an arch development more on the premolar area. That's, that's always, it's going to be practically, we're going to have always that, that's a part of the, of the arch more narrow. And we're doing some early class relax, elastics here. Okay, we've had the, rectangular copper nitride wires. And we can see how the space in the lower opens. That's why we're using the class three elastics to control the, the interior flaring of the incisors. But we can see how the upper arch is more, it's, it's more wider now, it's developing. And in December, okay, after this, well, between this, I, we put uh, some implants on the, on the palatal part so we can intrude. I don't have that much time so that I'm not putting those pictures, but we, we intruded a little bit the, the posterior teeth so we can close the bite on the anterior. Now, this is um, once we finish the intrusion and we start using some elastics. Uh, I'm, I, um, for the midline discrepancies, I'm gonna, um, I suggest that you don't use them crossed on the anterior because when you use them in the anterior part, a side that's a little bit more uncomfortable for the patient because of the tongue, it, what happens, you, you, can, you can do a canting on the occlusal plane. So if we want to use some midline elastics, it's better to use them like this, you know, like a class three, put some um, crimpable uh, post on the lower and use it more horizontal. It helps us better so we can correct the midline in a more horizontal vector. Here we have the interior. And this is how we're, we're going to use a class three elastic with also a midline component on the on the uh, on the anterior part. So she was a very good patient. She used very very good her elastics, and you can see how the midline is corrected already. Now what we need to do is we put it here some delta vector elastics just to close the, the bite on the anterior. We have a little bit open bite there, just to finish. And you can see that, that that's the little open bite that we want to close there. But this, this uh, delta elastics are going to be in, in the canine zone a little bit anterior to the center resistance of the maxilla. And it's better for closing the bite there. But we can see the cluster is corrected. We have, um, we have some tip back bends on the seven upper sevens. That's why we did a, we did convert, we opened the, the, we did convertible the two of the six. That's why we have a, a elastomeric uh, ligature there. I always, when I put one there, I put them a bright color so I remember that I have them there because if we put it a gray or a transparent one, we're not gonna we're not gonna remember when we see the patient again. So that's why I put them color, you know, like black, red, blue. And th that was in March. In in May, we did the, the bonding. That was approximately two years into treatment, and you can see the final result. Now we have a more wider smile. She doesn't show, we, we didn't extrude much the incisors, so we closed the bite good by intruding the, the posterior bite. And we can see she, that's the day of the bonding. She has a little bit sore, the, uh, sore the, the gingiva from the lower. But you can see the, the, the midline is it's on. We have a correct overbite and we have the, she, did, she doesn't have any restorations here. 
we can see class one on the right and on the left, we have a class canine, also class one canine. And we have the arch development. You can see how, now how much uh, developed the upper arch is. And when she smiles, she shows more teeth and that's more aesthetic. Okay, we're gonna do a little comparison of, of initial and final. This is the initial photograph and this is the final ones. If we analyze, we did intrude a little bit the incisors. So that helped us, you know, and, and but more in the posterior, that's what helped us to close the smile. This is the frontal. Now we have a, we closed the bite. We have a midline on. We can see the arch form, how it changed. And in this case, you know, I like to use a lot the daemon um, arch form that's more wider in the, in the cana and the premolar area. And the, the lower arch is just, it, it, was, it was a little bit contracted because of the upper at the beginning, but you can see it's well aligned at the end. And we have you know, the class one canine and, and more. And we can see the beginning and the end. This is the, the pictures on the interior. Now, before we took the brackets off, we did a gingivectomy with, with a laser. This is a diet laser, okay? So this is what was the initial, uh, how she had her gums at the beginning. And we can see because of the crossbite, we have very flat gingival margins. And once we, we, before we took the brackets off, in this case, we decided to do the gingivectomy prior to taking the brackets off. So if we needed to do a little compensation on the teeth, we can do it before taking the brackets out. So we did, this is the gingivectomy with the dial laser. And the, the advantage of doing it with, with laser is that the, um, the it, it it doesn't bleed that much it's more uh, the the our patient recovers more easily more faster and this is at the end uh, approximately a month after the gingivectomy now in this so we're going to talk a little bit about a uh, gingival or or anatomical um, shape we're going to use this concept called smile curve and it's from dr carlos camara from brazil this is a book that he has from Dental Press. That's his um, webpage. He also has this article from Dental Press. This is from December, 2006. And, he, and he's talking about the, the reference diagrams of, of, of aesthetics, of teeth aesthetic and of facial aesthetics. And what the concept of smile curve is, is this template, okay? In this template, we have the, the teeth size and we're gonna use a little, some dots this, all this, we're going to work in photographs. Okay. So once you take the photograph of the patient, you start, I'm going to show you how we work this out. And for example, we have the contour of our teeth and what we, we're going to put uh, some uh, dots there on the, on the papilla and on the, on the connectors on the lower. Okay. Once we put those dots there, we're going to do some, uh, we're going to put some figures connecting these figures and we can see how we have a very um, symmetric and symmetric and aesthetic smile line there, okay? Smile curve, sorry. And we can see the connectors always on the, on the central incisor is gonna be a 50% of length. Then in between uh, uh, central and lateral is gonna be 40% and from lateral to kind of is gonna be about 30%. So if, and well, we have the, the smile arc and our guides from the margin. Now, in this case, we can see how always we're going to try to put the lateral a little bit of a millimeter or two below the line of the canines and the centrals. Depends on, on, on your preferences, aesthetics. So this is the concept of smile curve. Now, we're going to put it in our patient so you can see how this works. This is the initial photograph. So we put these dots there on the papilla and in the, in the connectors in the lower. And if we put the this blocks or these figures, we can see how it looks very very asymmetric. It's not it's not symmetrical there. So once we leveled, we put them again, and it looks a little bit more better. But we still don't have that symmetry. So this is when we do the gingivectomy, and now in this case we put the dots, and you can look how it looks more symmetrical in this case. Now, in this patient, she had a smaller right lateral than on the left. I suggested her to do some uh, composite restoration on the right lateral. She didn't want it to, so it's okay. And at the end, we can look how, how this smile curve looks like. So it's more symmetric and that's, that's a, a simple way 
for us to see what what changes we need to do in the in the in our teeth in our smile. Okay, this is uh, we're comparing the the final with the initial, and you can see the different anatomical shape of the teeth. And this is the final result. So we can see how we have a more aesthetic uh, treatment here. Now, uh, this patient tells me that everybody tells her if she did some veneers, but no, the only thing that we do, we change the position, the position of the teeth and we change the, the, the gingival margins. And that's, that's, uh, that was enough for us to, to bet, do a, a much more beautiful smile for our patient. This is another picture from Monterey. And well, I, I'm gonna start finishing here. This is a picture of my students right now. I always put them in every lecture I do because uh, I always say that you, you're, they're the, they're the ones that inspire us to be, do better our job, to be a better teacher and to be a better orthodontist. And I, I, it's, it's, a, it's beautiful to work with young uh, doctors because uh, you feel younger, you have a good time and you learn a lot. That's, that's the more important thing. And well, we, we work on a lot of cases and, and for me, it's been a very, it's, it's very, it's a beautiful experience because I learn more from them than they from me. You have to be your best with the youngsters. Yes, and well, this is just a, a, another quote at the end that, that, that says that li during our life, we, we're, it's a long-term path. We're teachers and students. Sometimes it's our turn to teach, but every day is our turn to learn. So we can, every day we, we must try to learn something more of what we do. It's very important for that, okay? So I would like to thank you here um, thank you very much for this invitation. And I, I think that we can now start if we need to have some questions. Yes, we do have. Okay, uh, first of all, <clears throat> let me just put it forward to you. Excellent presentation, very crisp. Thank you. And <clears throat> wonderful cases been treated uh, without use of a lot of other things. I must say that uh, many of the cases where wouldn't have been done uh, or given justice without doing a smile design. Sure, uh, it's an excellent. We have some panelists here. Few of them are okay. even a speaker for Demon in India. Okay, and, great, uh, great. <clears throat> and we do have some eminent Indian uh, orthodontists as well, who all benefited by your lecture. I'm sure they they enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, uh, I'll just go through the question sections as well. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Anupam Agarwal. Uh, material use for mock-up, can we do it on our own or is it required a good lab support? No, you need a lab support. Uh, in, in this case, in, in my office, I work with... Uh, with uh, other other specialists and I, I am not I'm not good doing the wax design what I tell them I, I tell them I want the with the tooth or, or a certain size and the lab the lab is the one that does that you no know, we have a restorative paid a doctor in our office and he's the one she's the one she's a woman she's the one who does all this 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 work so it, that's that's the support of the of the team what I do is only ortho, but, but we do the planning together. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so uh, which material it is? Oh, the material for the, well, it's wax. And for the, the mock-up we use, uh, it's a visceral resin from Evoclar, Bibodent. It's, okay. it's called Telio. 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 Telio from, from Evoclar. Evoclar. Okay, great. Yes. The second question is, can you please briefly demonstrate the use of functions of a smile design software? I think it is not possible in this lecture. Is it possible to show the little bit about the software? Smile designing yeah, software? It, it, the, the, the smile, okay. The smile design software, if you can, you can, you can use the app from a smile design and what you do there, you only send the picture and they do that. Okay, now uh, there are a lot of um, programs right now that you only send the picture and they do the design. In this case, what we do, we use um, we use uh, the keynote. The keynote, uh, you use keynote and you start overimposing the figures, like I told you, and you start. That's how we do the the planning. But uh, it, 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 we will take you know a little bit, a lot of time to do that right now. It, it, 
because you need to show you know how to to put the the most important thing of this is the picture you need to take a very good intro alert, you know with angulated picture because if you do it for, uh, if you do use a normal uh front occlusal picture it's not a photograph it's not going to work you need a very uh, an angulated one with a contrast you can if you don't have a, a black contrast what i suggest sometimes you can use a a mouth mirror for photographs and put them a black glove on it and you can use that as a contrast now with that picture taken you put it in in your keynote or your powerpoint uh, uh you know a program and you overimpose the figures and that's how you do the planning that's but, what like uh, we we have a uh, day after tomorrow we have somebody from chile dr uh, okay. milo sherrington okay okay uh he would be teaching us on the same like digital diagnosis and treatment planning using your powerpoint as well as uh keynote okay great that, yes that, that's what uh, he would be teaching us on so it is exactly okay. the same what you are saying but probably uh more on the uh cephalometric aspect than on this okay. okay great no well that that's not an option but this is just practice you know there that's just uh it takes time from taking Yes, it takes time, but it, but it's easy. Once you understand it, it's easy. It's it's more easy to do. It's very simple. Okay, great. Uh, another question is, uh, hi sir. Number one question is to have a pleasing smile. Will you do IPR, interproximal reduction, for more yes, parallel it, connection between the anterior teeth? Yes, it's 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 important. But but first of all, before you do IPR, I I I like to measure the teeth. Now, once you measure them, and you know, normally, and in school, every, they taught us to use the Bolton analysis. Now, it's, it's, yes. it's good to, to do that. But it's easier if you use like this, the, the figure or the table that, that Dr. Shu works, because you you're talking about in 0.5 millimeters, it doesn't vary that much. So it's easier to say, well, we have white teeth, but we don't need that. That's when we do the, the, the IPR. But um, really it's you you must use it in in the cases that it's 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 indicated not not in every patient but but if you want to do a more uh, uh if you have a different anatomical form of the teeth it's important to do the ipr okay what yes, is I the do. minimum aesthetic buccal corridor space for smile designing okay no depends on the patient because it, it depends on 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 the tissue you know if you have a very wide you know lips then if you have a wide arch you're going to have negative space you know, it depends on every patient, but the ideal thing is to have your your premolars upright on the on the mid part of the of the arch. Once you if you have them upright, it's going to look good. The the buccal corridors. One of the problems that we have with it it happens and and all, to all of us it had happened that when when we do extraction case and we close spaces, sometimes we don't we we close the spaces and we have very red planar incisors and and can, canines and premolars. And right. at the end, we don't we don't have time, you know, to upright them because the patient wants to finish the treatment. You've already have a long time with the patient, so sometimes we don't leave it vertical. But the but my recommendation is to to look for it on on the premolars and canine position to have them very upright, and that's going to help you to so it looks more full the 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 arch and also the arch form the arch form that you use. Okay, uh, there's a question from Dr. Akhil Agarwal. If possible, please elaborate once again how to, to how to choose bracket position if the gingival margin heights are already at improper heights. So you do a gingivectomy first, and then you do bracket placement. Yes, if if it, the case is is uh, if if the case is needed to do some some crown uh, lightening, you know, uh, uh, if you need to do gingivectomy, I, I do it. Uh, most on um, premolars sometimes because they have a very short uh, in 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 young patients they have a very short distance of the crown uh, in the premolar area. But uh, first of all, what I do is is measure the teeth. If my and and um, I position the bracket on the two sides. It's rare to put do the gingivectomy first. Almost what would I do is just level the margins and then. We use the gingivectomy. It's I, I prefer to do it at the end of the treatment, if on the anterior part. Uh, but when we knew, when you when you need to do the gingivectomy, so you can place the bracket. I do it at the beginning. But okay. for the aesthetic reason, I always do it at the end or prior to taking the brackets off, or once we took the brackets off. Okay, got it. The next question is, uh, what is your favorite intrusion method for upper anteriors? 
Well, in in the end, the, the, for intrusion, you can use a lot of things. You know, I used to use a lot like utility arches that that Dr. Ricketts used. You know, the 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 um, yeah, the utility, you know, uh, the, the intrusion arches, double arch. But um, for me, it has been more easy right now to put mini implants. You know, it's easier, it's more faster. You you don't use that much of, of you know, auxiliaries. So it's more easy to do that. But um, that that's what I, I do more easily. More, more it's, So it, it's more practical in my in my practice. Okay. We have somebody from Chijuana, uh, Mexico, who is raising oh, hand. Yeah? Daniel Sarilo. Uh, oh think, yeah, he's a friend. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I think he ha he has raised his hand, so uh, sh sh I'll just allow him to talk. Yeah, Dr. Daniel, you are you are allowed to talk. You have any question to ask? Dr. Daniel, you are there. I think he's not there. <laughs> yeah, he's not there. Okay. Uh, then we have a question is sir, in uh, like, okay, I do have a question, Doc. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, you, you using a pitch protocol for uh, bonding and give a smile arc protected, uh, like smile arc. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes. you're using all the, most of the cases you're using is with a passive self ligating that is a demon clear. Yes. What is your take on, uh, it's not about company, but I think pitch has his own uh, 21 also now with the orthopathic. Yes. So yes, yes. Uh, uh, it would be the same result or uh, like here, does it matter which system we use or it's about- No, no, no. You, can, you can use this planning on every type of bracket. You know, I, I also, I use self like in brackets, but I also use normal uh, conventional literature uh, brackets. Uh, I like to use uh, the MBT uh, prescription. And, and for example, Dr. Pitts, he has a 21 by 21 slot size. And what what the what the difference there is that in in a very early stage of the treatment they use they fill up the slot. Yes. So what he does and it's like a little uh, confusion there because a lot of people think that he puts the bracket very right. high, but what he does he puts the bracket in a certain position for the marginal ridges, but he does also some uh, aesthetic recontouring. You know he he does uh, an animal reduction or he lengthens the teeth with composites. That's why we look at very long teeth. If you look at his cases, they, they all have very long teeth because what he does, he does a much more aesthetic lengthening of the teeth. That's a little bit like, like what we did here, but uh, he does that. That's why you look at very longer or more, more wider smile. And the, the, the thing there in his bracket is that in a very early stage, he, he sometimes he inverts the bracket so he doesn't have flaring of the anterior teeth. So that's at, and and because he uses a very wide arch form, very wide arch form. That's why it, it helps if you have uprighted the incisors and lock them up. You can do a more a, a more broad smile at 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 the, at the posterior. That's why he locks like a, that's why he he controls more the torque in the beginning of, of the treatment. Because if we use normal brackets, if you lose slot slot twenty two, by the time you get into a nineteen by twenty five arch wire. It could pass yeah. a year, and what he does, he does it in a very early stage of the he treatment. He starts so, with the uh, coponita, and he, he fills the slot completely, twenty-one by twenty-one. Yes, he, he fills them up very, very early stage, and that's why he he locks them up. And in cases that he wants to to do a more broad smile in the posterior, he he flips the bracket so he doesn't have that flaring of the teeth, and that helps him to do, to develop the arch form on the back. Any any first-hand experience using twenty-one protocol, uh, twenty-one pits, twenty-one. No, I'm I'm I, I'm using I'm starting to use in some cases of that because I I, I, I want to try I, I like to try all kinds of brackets. No, okay, great. But but yes, yesterday you, you had, don't. Yesterday we had somebody from Brazil who spoke about the dual slot bracket as well. That is Dr. Tahir Hamid. Uh, anyways. Oh yes, I saw him. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Trevesi is use Hugo Trevesi is using it a lot now. The the double arch uh, treatment. Okay. Uh, the next question is: You have a time, right? Uh, no, 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 I have no problem. Okay. Uh, in case, like Sakti Kumar is asking, in case two, what could be the etiology for incisor wear? And was that resolved? The, no, the, the etiology, very good question. The, the, the reason why he had that wearing on the upper teeth was because of the asymmetric mandible. 
he has a very asymmetric uh, mandible in the beginning. If you see the, the, the arch form was uh, to the right. And that's why I, that's what I think happened. And with the pass of time, he had a lot of wearing on his teeth. That's why that, that, that he had that, that uh, occlusion. So uh, what we did was change the position of the teeth so it looked better. So we, we're protecting it. That's why um, in this case, we're suggesting him to use, do a restorative treatment, you know, so he, from canine to canine, like veneers, so he can protect the, the, the canine guy. And also uh, suggesting in this, in this patient was to use uh, uh, like a mouth guard at, the, at, at night, you know, a, a splint, a splint. Okay. In speak. most of your cases, you say you 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 said that you you are using a fixed uh, retainer in the lower arch. Yes. Uh, what about yes. the upper arch? You using Essex or uh, something else? No, I use a, a, a in in the most of the cases I use a a, a conventional wraparound syn synchro. Um, yes, like a howley, but but a yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'm of, aware of yeah. wraparound because we have been trained in bags in our postgraduate days and that was the choice of uh, uh, retainer in yes I, I prefer that retainer so you can have a more settlement of the occlusion uh, mm -hmm. the problem with the, the the Essex or if you use like a plastic uh, retainer it wears off very very fast and the second thing that I don't like is that it, when the patient uses it it bites on the on the posterior exactly. you don't have it like a like a even so in cases when I suggest the splint, what we do, we do the, the like the Essex uh, splint in the beginning, then we put some um, acrylic on the front part. So we have a, an incisor guide and it has, uh, it touches the front and the back teeth. So it doesn't just on the posterior because that's what I don't like about the, the Essex kind. It's more easy to do it, more fast, more aesthetic, but um, it wears out very easy. So I prefer the wraparound. Okay, uh, Dr. Puna Magarwal's question. Uh, uh, are you changing intracanine width uh, during the treatment? In most of the cases, that's what she thinks. And what about relapse in such cases? Okay, you... that, that's, a very, that's a very interesting question because we know that uh, we've all, we were thought that if we modify the intracanine width, we're gonna have some um, relapse. Okay, that's not gonna be a stable case. In, this, in, in the majority of the cases, I don't change the, the, the intracanine width. What we do is it's more uh, uh, from the premolars to the back is where we position them more wider because uh, we're not looking to expand or over expand. If you look at the cases, we don't have a, a flared a teeth. We always have uprighted. That's the difference between, for example, in this case, daemon prescription and the premolars. We have a more a negative torque on the, on the back. So it has more upright on the premolars. So we don't have that flaring. Uh, okay. it, when we need to, when we need need to do extractions, we we do extractions. Okay. Okay. I uh, like uh, when this comes to uh, you. You said I'm in uh, demon uh, braces. I think most of the time you have uh, customized the arch wire, right? You 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 yeah. are not most of yes, the time I've seen that you 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 are customizing the arch wire rather than using the demons uh, uh, standard arch wires. Well, we use the, the, the for example, the, the initial copper nitide wires, they're from the Daemon art form. Now, at the, at, when, we, when we use um, stainless steel wires, we, we do a, a, a bite, we, we, we use a, a okay, wax okay, well. to do okay. the bite, and we customize the wires when, when we're working with, with stainless steel at the end, because every patient has different art form. That's, and, but and, uh, at, the, at the, yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead, sorry. Yes, at, at the end is when we customize and, and we coordinate the wires. So we have the upper and the lower that, that's, that's done for each patient. But at the beginning, the, the standard round and, and rectangular uh, copper nitrate wires are, are from the, yeah, the standard. Those, those, those wires are flexible enough uh, not to cause yes. any flaring of the buckle segment. Okay. Yes, the buckle uh, segment. In most of the wires, you had a V, v band in the interiors. Was it for just uh, for uh, like you incorporated in torque separately on both the side or? Was it for yes, I, I, I use a, there's a plier, a plier that has a V stop. It's called yes, V stop plier. Yes, yes. And I use it uh, just to, to just not because, to slide it. Yes. And with, with so it, like it works like a stop. And I tell the patients uh, if you, if your wire, if you see it that's not centered, just push it. So, so because in self lighting brackets, there, there's a tendency for the wire to move a lot. And uh, since I don't use those peripheral stops on, on the stainless steel, on, and a lot of the patients, I use that V stop 
bend. But I do it with a V-stop plier so it doesn't modify the, the form of the arch. If you try to do it with the, with the three, um, with the three pick, um, three, three, uh, yeah, three jaw plier. Yes. Three jaw three, three plier. You, you can have a, you can do it uh, very asymmetric to work. Uh, work. What we do in our practice is we either put uh, stops or, or we use mm -hmm. uh, composites, you know, so that yes. it also acts as a stop. Okay. Uh, yes. It, it, Dr. Daniel, uh, Daniel Cerillo has sent a message. Uh, good morning. I had a problem with the audio. I just wanted to congratulate Dr. Garcia for his presentation. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Okay, uh, I think we had the same question about V-band. It has been answered, I think, Dr. Gora. Dr. Harsha Tolani is asking, thank you, sir, for amazing presentation. When you build thank up you. tooth and the rebound bracket, uh, there might be a damage to the surface of buildup. What protocol you follow? In in the, uh, for example, uh, in... I think she okay. she she wants to ask about you, you do a buildup of the uh, uh, teeth, right? Okay. Where, where there is uh, there's a wearing off is ha has happened. So you just build it up and then you do a rebonding. Yes, and ideally, uh, in this cases, because I was using aesthetic brackets, I didn't took the bracket, I didn't debond the brackets. But okay. the ideal, in 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 every case, is to debond the bracket so you can clean it very good. The, the, our our dentist does the re the restoration, then you rebond rebond the brackets. It's a very good moment to do a, a rebonding and because when... sometimes in in the beginning we can put misplaced the brackets a little bit. So if you rebond them be better. In this case, I didn't do that because they were aesthetic brackets, but, but, but then, ideally, you have to bend you, a, then you have to give a band in that particular area so that you can get the desired movement, right? Yes, the desired kind of moment. In, in this case, that's why I planned a lot of the positioning, but in one case, if you saw, I had to do a, a, a step up on the canine because my position wasn't good and I couldn't take the bracket off because it was gonna break. So I just did a little bit of step up and in, uh, in, uh, in I think it was a third case in the canine. And I, I bend a lot of wires because you know, yes. no, no, no prescription is perfect. You always end up bending and doing and nothing's magical. It's their brackets, mini implants, they're just tools to help us to do our job. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, all the residents are getting the same message every uh, in every, uh, Webinar, they are getting the same message that you need to be a good, a good wire bender to be a good orthodontist. Yes. Otherwise, there's no difference between you doing it and robot doing it. Of course, yes. Right. Yeah, no, the, the most important thing here is to think what, we, what you're going to do. That's, that's the, 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 for the students or residents, that's the message. You need to think first and understand what you're going to do. That's more easier. It's a, it's a, it's a mental exer exer exercise. Yeah, okay. Even. What is your biomechanics? Uh, uh, Dr. Pravalika Gora is asking. Biomechanics in, in what sense? Uh, I, I know. She, it's a very vague question she asked. Like, can you uh, please explain the biomechanics? So, like, I think uh, it is same of Demon, what biomechanics? Uh, yes, I, I, I like to use, I, I like lots of MBT, like the MBT prescription and, and how they, uh, they do sliding mechanics. And, and it's more very similar. I like to use, uh, you know, soft forces just to wait for the arch to develop. And, um, and in cases that we need to do extractions, I, I, I like the, the prescription of Damon because you can use high torque brackets. So you can, you know, so you don't have that flaring or, or, or deep in the bite with high torque brackets, but it, you don't need to have a self-liking bracket. You can you can use, uh, I use the MBT brackets from TP or well. to conventional brackets. And in the TP brackets, I can buy some high torque anterior brackets. Also in MBT, you can also uh, invert your canine so you can have a high torque and low torque. And that's, you know, I, I try to use the same principles in any every kind of bracket. That's why I prefer that conventional bracket. And I like also the Damon brackets because you have the, the option to, to have that, that variable prescription. Okay. There's a question from Dr. To Pai Ang. I would like to know, is the stability of case that was changed the arch form? Another question is, do you use the DSD smile design in most of your cases? And how do you do, and, how do you, how do you get the one is to one ratio in the picture 
in Keynote. Okay, and if you want to like uh, do a similar, okay, that's a good question. So you don't change it, for example, in this, in this, uh, no, I have another one. I have a slide where I have the two, okay. Like this, what I do when you're working, this is, you can see my, my screen. Okay, this is a, a keynote and you, we, you, if you put command R, you put the ruler. Okay, there, there comes a ruler on the edge of the, of the screen. And if you right click on here, you can extend a line. Okay, that's, that's to do the proportion of the T. So you can put another line here. This, you don't see these lines in the, on the presentation. They're just lines that help you to do the proportion of the T so they look the same. So this helps you a lot to, you see the canine is almost at the same position and the canine on the other part is almost at the same position. So you don't have that much variable, but that's how you can do to do them the same. That's how you, you, you make them proportion. Now, uh, the, the, the pictures you, so you can over, you overimpose them when you're doing the DSD. That's how you, you, you can do that. We have one panelist, a very senior eminent uh, orthodontist from India, wants to ask, uh -huh. uh, uh, Unjal, sir, please, can you uh, ask, sir? Very good presentation. I would like to ask you about the criteria. Rather, I would like you to elaborate on the criteria to decide, are you going to intrude the posteriors as you did in one of your cases, and when Particularly, you would like to intrude only interiors to manage the gingival display. Secondly, I would like you to decide, uh, inform about the criteria about the transfers management for buccal corridor, and also elaborate some of the youngsters about the different talk prescription which you will need it in case you place your bracket positioning towards more gingival side. So these are the three questions which I am placing. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Uh, yes, uh, the thing is like um, for the position of the brackets, okay, uh, that's the article that I'm going to go back a little bit. This is the bracket placement article from Dr. Balut that it, it's talking about that when you do a variation and your position of the brackets, in, if you do it, it it's, it's not that uh, much, you know, if you have a central and your lateral proportional, you do a lot of uh, variation in the height and in the, in the position of the brackets, that's where you have different uh, problems with the position. So if you have a, a correct size of the tooth first and you put the bracket, you don't need to put it that gingival. You know, sometimes um, it's a big mistake to put it more gingival. Um, if you have a short crown and you try to do that, you're going to have a, a, a irritation and you're going to have a lot of plague there. But um, I really don't go more than six millimeters, seven is too much. It depends also on the size of the crown, but regularly I, I try to place them at five or 5.5 millimeters. I don't go that high, but if you do that, you can have a variation in, in the angulation of the incisors in the front. Now uh, for the intrusion, they were asking, uh, let me, I'm gonna go a little bit away here. You had a cephalogram. We showed and informed about your criteria for intrusion in the posterior teeth. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to open the, the presentation because that, that was a an, uh, okay to to go more deep in that on the patient. Okay, in this one. Okay, in this case, I what we're doing we're if I extrude the incisors there. Okay, what was gonna, what, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna have a more, uh, I'm gonna show more the incisor display because she has a very short lip. Now, if we look at the occlusal plane, she has a, a posterior occlusal plane and she has another one, another anterior one, it's different. Okay, now you can see the over portion. Now, what we did in this case to do the, the intrusion on the, on the posterior, we put a mini implant in the midline. Okay, and this is the, the picture of that case, two by eight. And we using this criteria to use it, uh, we put it between the premolars so we can have, that's where we have more thickness of the cortical bone. I use a, 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 a contra angle 
instrument. So I can put it from behind to front, you know, to do that angulation. I don't put it on the midline exactly because what we do is a little angulation. The midline, we have the suture, so it's more dense, the bone. We put it a little bit, about a millimeter off and inclinate it to the center. And the, the, what the, the, um, the appliance that I used to intrude, I took it from Dr. Storino from Brazil. This is a, uh, she has a YouTube uh, video that's, that's I, I'm putting there. And what she does, she uses um, Propel, like micro perforations on the buckle and on the palatal. And she puts this, uh, it's like a TPA, but it has a occlusal, you know, she, she bonds it. It's called Triad Hell. It's uh, from Densply. It's an acrylic resin and it, it, it works like a bite block on the posterior. And also with the mini implants, she's doing the scopes to intrude. This is a patient of mine that we put mini implants on the front. It's another case. And we use this, this appliance so we can intrude a little bit on the posterior. Now, this is the patient that I was showing you that that's the, the appliance that she had. It's very important when, we, when you do like an intrusion like this, you have to put a, 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 a speaker on the posterior, on the seven and the six, because we, we're only intruding on, on the mid of the arch, like on the six and the five you know, region. And it, you, you, you can only intrude that if you use it, this appliance. So you need to put a curve of speed and step up in the posterior sevens. So you can also intrude the posterior sevens, because if you, do, you don't do that, you're only going to open the bite in the middle. Okay, I don't, I think, I, I hope I explained myself with that. And this is the appliance, and I use the triad, triad gel. And it's easy to manipulate better than using uh, any other kind of cement. And it's, this is this, this article from JCO 2018 from Dr. Kravitz that it talks, this is the triad gel, the one I used to bond that appliance. It's from Densply. And I use it also as turbo bites or buildups. So uh, for, to disarticulate, it's the one in the beginning. It's very easy to manipulate, but the disadvantage, it shrinkens and it, it comes loose very easy. It's more, you know, you can use another kind of resin, so it's better, but at the manipulation and at the end, the, the, when you get it off, it's more difficult. So I prefer to use this, this material to do that intrusion. And that's why I did that. This is the appliance that we use. Okay, I, I, we soldered it and we cemented. And this function is that, that the patient is biting also with it. And so you can, if you want to intrude in the posterior, I use the appliance on the upper, but in the lower arch, we put curve of speed, a reverse curve of speed in the, in the molars. So as we intrude the posterior in the back, also the lower ones, we intrude a little bit the, the molars. And that's what's helped us to close the bite without affecting the position of the, of the frontal incisor. Let me show you the before and after of that patient. This is the, okay, this is a radiograph of this patient. And we can see the before and after, how we change the occlusal plane a little bit there. Okay. okay and, and that's the, a, a slight change on the, on the facial height and the, on the front. And that's what helped us to close the bite on this patient that I was showing you. And the, it was a question of, of the, the criteria in the back, uh, um, the bracket position. And what was the other question? I don't remember. Uh, there was uh, basically, I, this you have, you have really explained it very nicely that how you intrude and it's going to be very beneficial for lots of people I also benefited a lot by seeing your intrusion arches, uh, particularly with the help of the appliance that you had designed and shown me. Uh, but what is the criteria basically? Do you take into position the incisor display and or any cephalometric landmarks which guide you that this patient goes in for posterior intrusion or this patient goes in for anterior intrusion? Any guidelines okay, yeah. or criteria? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for your kind words. Uh, really, I, I didn't design the appliance. I, I just, uh, I, I like to take it away. I told you uh, that was from Dr. Storino. She, I saw it from her. The criteria, I, I you know, I, 
reading like the position of the, of the clusal plane, the angulation of the clusal plane, that's what um, Dr. Ricketts did a lot, you know, like changing the, the position or, or in this case, this patient had two occlusal planes. He had, she had one in the front and one in the posterior. So we wanted to level it. And the, the, that's why we, 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 if you see, we flatten in the, the, the clusal plane, the lower. And if you see here, we're flat, let, let me take, I, because I see here, put that, okay. Okay, we, we're flattening the, the, the crucial plane. And this is done a lot also by intruding a little bit the posterior, but in the lower. And as we use the elastics, that was, was I was telling you, we, we use the curve of speed. We, we intruded them a little bit and the posterior also a little bit in the back. And that's what they did. But actually by looking at the, at the occlusal plane in the, in the, in the, in the, in the x-ray, that's why we took the decision of doing that change on the, on, on the position of the occlusal plane. And it's very slightly the change, but that's good enough so we can close the bite on the anterior. That's why she was asymmetric also. She had, she had a, a mandible a little bit uh, um, to the right and we intrude a little bit more on the left side. That's why it, it intrudes more. It, it, that's how, what helped me. But that, that the criteria is, is most ba mostly based on the position of the occlusal plane there. So is it clear? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. And uh, your criteria for your buccal corridor management, when you want to improve Sir, your voice is not clear. This is a problem in my network, I guess. Okay, well, uh, 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 I, but yes, I to, to see to the criteria for, for widening the, the arch or, or, or modifying the arch form. Sir, your voice, uh, Munjal, sir. Munjal, so your voice is um, not clear. Any, okay, uh, I'll try to type on the chat box. Yeah, please, please do that. Meanwhile, I'll just take another question. Dr. Yeah, Amrita sure, please Chandra. Go ahead. Uh, please sir, go. do you follow in specific case selection protocol for using veneers over composite buildups? It, yes, it depends on the, I, I, what I do is depending on the age of the patient. And if, if we have a young patient, we use composite, okay? But uh, the veneers are, are it, 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 well, it's not by age. You know, a lot of young patients look for veneers or want veneers, but um, the criteria is much more if you have um, color, different colors in, in the teeth, if you have different proportions, if, if you have a, a lot of uh, symmetry there, it's better to do, do veneers because that, that way you change the color you change the form and you change the size of the tooth. But if it's only uh, slightly, you know, the, the it's, it, it, if it's only one tooth or two, you can use composites. And I, I believe it's better, it's more conservative. Obviously it's not that resistance of veneers, but you're being more um, conservative treatment for our patients. And I prefer to do that, more conservative treatment. But uh, depends a lot on the age, if you're older, so, uh, uh, remember what, what are the signs and symptoms of, of an old mouth of an old patient wearing and and uh, uh, cracking on the tooth and also uh, color change and if you're younger you have the, the patients have much a bit more a better color a better size of the teeth so that's when you can use a more conservative treatment but if you have an older patient well you can use uh, uh, you can do the veneers because if you change the form the color that helps the patient to have a more younger a more beautiful smile. And what I, I believe that the doctor wanted a question to, to how do you, you know, uh, criteria or you can use the Waller Ridge um, measurement so you can see if you can widen the arch because uh, 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 it's very important that because it, it's sometimes you, you cannot over expand, you cannot over widen the, an arch because it's not going to be stable. It's just in certain cases, you, you can do that, but not in every case. Okay, we have somebody from uh, Mexico, Paula okay. Carbayol, uh, saying, Hola, thank you, Dr. Jorge. Wonderful talk, amazing cases. Greeting from Mexico. What was your favorite case and why? Okay, uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, I, uh, what's my favorite case? Well, Every case I like, I don't have a, a, a preference. 
what what I like to I, I what I like to do and and a suggestion that I do to everybody take pictures of your cases. Uh, I take I tell I tell my I tell my students the uh, minimal you can take them every four months and sit down and analyze the pictures because only in a in a big computer screen you can you have the time to sit the case to analyze it. It's sometimes we begin the treatment and we're not like very sure of the planning, but you can you can change you know your plan during the treatment. I, I what I liked a lot more of the cases is to sit down and analyze them. And and in the and almost in every case, I can tell you that in every case, I see things that I I, I could I did wrong, you know, some mistakes that probably are not that terrible, but I try to to analyze it, be very objective, so it doesn't happen to me again in another case. But we're we're all uh, extent or we're all exposed to having mistakes. But it's very important to see them and correct them, of course. I hope I, my residents are listening to you. Probably they, they they won't they may not listen to me, but at least they would listen to you. That they have to take <laughs> pictures <laughs> as and when possible. <laughs> okay. Yes, you know I, I tell the residents not every not every appointment. You can, if you want to see a real change, at least every four months. But if you see something very specific, you can take a picture at appointment. That that's okay. Exactly. But exactly. But but not in all cases. But sit because, down because and you can you can get that stage big. Uh, you know, uh, once it is gone, it is gone. It is better to capture that particular thing in your camera, because you know uh, that will teach you a lot of things. You you would become your self critic as well as. Uh, self learner also if you see pictures of uh, all pictures of your patient where you are going wrong and where you are going right okay. yes uh, doctor and, and a suggestion yeah. so another suggestion you 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 should tell your patient to stand up at every appointment and see your patient standing up and smiling if you do that with the patient in the in the chair, chair. you can't see a good smile you need to Very stand true. them up and see the first thing when the patient comes to your office tell them smile and when they smile you can see things and you can see positions. You can see things more uh, of the smile with the face. And that's that. That's the moment to take decisions there. Okay, uh, Dr. Gautam Munja, he, he couldn't uh, talk. He, he has just written some message here. Transverse okay. management, buccal corridor, premolar position or inclination. That's what he wanted to ask. Okay, the, the inclination, it, it's, the thing here is that when we're using a self-ligating bracket like this, the daemon heat, it has a more negative torque. So you're, you don't have that flaring. If you do this very fast, you're gonna have a, a, your, 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 pot, your palatal cups will, will go down and you're gonna have an open bite. Right. That's why you need to do a, a transverse. But if, if you see the cases or you overimpose them, almost the, the transverse, um, widening, we're going to have it on the on the premolars area, not on the molars or or the canines. Because if you modify a lot in that area, you're going to have um, you're going to you're going to have relapse, or you're going to have an uh, you're going to provoke an open an open bite. It's more on the premolar. But you you when you see the cases, uh, look at the front picture. They're almost all the all the premolars are are tucked in. That's where you have to do the writing there. This is a question from Dr. Anupam Agarwal. I, I'll take two, three more questions. So because okay, uh, okay. I know I know it's a morning time for you, an early morning there. And, no, it's uh, perfect. <laughs> okay, Dr. Anupam Agarwal is asking, like most of the time we take intraoral pictures with the SLR cameras. I yes. guess we need to take intraoral picture at one is to one magnification ratio for correct measurement because you're doing it on uh, Keynote. Uh, is it correct? That's how it, like... It, how can we take I, one to one magnification ratio of the photographs? The magnification, I, I don't understand the okay. question. You, but, you, uh, the question is, he, he wants to ask that mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you are neither uh, enlarging the picture, you're not, uh, you know, uh, uh, the picture has to be, uh, I, I think, let him come. The doctor. Oh, okay. Yes, when, when, we, when we work with the picture, what I do, uh, when when I, I I always you know I use a Canon camera and I I take it with RAW. I use a, a macro a hundred mac, macro uh, hundred mac, uh, macro. So I have a you can have a very uh, uh, defined image. And when I put it on my computer, I always put on the picture to not modify the the to keep the the, the picture proportion. 
you know, when, when we put, when we put a picture, for example, here I have a keynote and you go here to format, you put, well, this is in Spanish, but in this point you put to maintain the proportion. So the, when you modify the size of the, of the, of the photograph, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, change. So it maintains the same radio. Rachel, I believe that's what the doctor is asking. Okay, uh, I, doctor, yeah, Dr. Anupam is there. Uh, Dr. Anupam, uh, is it what you were uh, asking? Yeah, nicely explained. Uh, very satisfied, thanks. Okay, oh, he's satisfied with your answer. Absolutely. Okay, okay the, there's somebody, uh, Alejandro and Rafe. Okay. I just want to send my congrats to my dear friend, my ex Rumi. And okay, com yeah. <laughs> compadre. Compadre. Yeah, compadre. <laughs> I compadre. didn't understand the compadre's meaning. Uh, uh, compadre is like a very good friend. It's okay. like a godfather, like uh, when Great you have speech. a son. Is, yes, yes. We have a lot of he, people he, from Mexico You uh, today in our webinar. It's great. Like early morning, so early they got up and they are attending this webinar. It's amazing. It's great, yeah. <laughs> okay. On Sunday. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sonaita is asking, thank you, Dr. Jorge, for the enriching webinar. Also for the patients for answering in details each and every question. We would thank love you, to you. have you here for more webinars. Even I would like to have you here for more webinars uh, and thank utilizing you. this uh, uh, lockdown period and whatever maximum we can extract from your knowledge, we would really love to have you again. So I'll talk to Dr. Jorge for the same and we would uh, work out something if we can do something on the same. Yeah, sure. Of course, uh, we, we can talk about a lot of topics and, and uh, it will be a pleasure for me to share with you and, and I, I will learn from you also. Yeah, okay. There are there are certain people wanted to ask uh, Dr. B.S. Chandrasekhar. I think, let me see whether he's there or not. Okay, I think he, he has left. Uh, any further questions? No. There, I, I'm going to put you my. This is my uh, my Instagram and my Facebook. If you want to, uh, you know, uh, get send me a yeah, yeah get connected. Uh, it will be a pleasure for me if if you want me to share some information that of the, of the things that I showed you here. Uh, I, I I always like to base what I do with with articles, with um, uh, evidence -based. I don't invent nothing. Yes, I don't invent nothing. Everything that I that you saw here, I learned it from somebody else. And uh, and you need, you know, to, to practice. And, and that's very important. You know, it, it's, I did not invent nothing. I just, I just tried to uh, use it in my practice and, and to, to share it, you know, that, and then anything that you need or you want to, for me to, to show you or share with you, it, it's a pleasure. Uh, it would be a pleasure for us as well. Like, uh, you know, it was a pleasure indeed. And I'm sure everybody has enjoyed his presentation. And, and I Thank personally also have learned a lot of new things seeing these cases. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Jorge, for sparing your uh, invaluable time it's so early in the morning uh, because there's a huge time difference uh, <laughs> yes. in Mexico. Uh, one thing we share very common with the Mexicans is one is a look. A lot of Indians look like a Mexican, or a lot of yes. Mexicans do look like an Indian. And the other yes. thing, which I, when I went to US, uh, it was a long trip for me. So the only thing, only food which I could survive other than Indian was Mexican food. And, okay, uh, yeah. Because we have a lot of spice food. It is also a similarity between India and Mexico. Right. Yes. Thank you so oh, much. What, 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 one of the wonderful things that I show you in the video is the food, tequila. Uh, and uh, mariachi and, and, and Mexico is a very beautiful country because we all we like party, we like oh. a lot of party and <laughs> and I, I, uh, but we, we we have wonderful beaches. If you want to come here, it's great. Well, when this when this lockdown passes, but uh, you do it, invite us for place. some Mexico uh, orthodontic conference. We would definitely love to get registered there, and we'll definitely try to come there. Of course, of course. Sometimes the association does very, very big uh, congresses and beaches, you know, in Cancun or in a beautiful beach. And that's those are the best ones because you have the sea, you have party and you have science. And I think Cancun has the longest unhindered beach in the world. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very beautiful place. All that, the, the Riviera Maya. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, 
uh, archaeological sites there, and it's very beautiful. You, you, have, you see everything there. It's very, very nice. Thank you. Uh, uh, before everybody goes, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, share about Tuesday's uh, webinar with all of you. Dr. Jorge, I would take only two minutes. Okay, perfect. Let me, let me, let me share, let me go up here. Yeah, no problem. Yes, there is. I'm so glad to be with you next Tuesday. Uh, I'm so honored to have been invited by Dr. Kubabat uh, to speak to you. Uh, beetle diagnosis is a subject that I'm very passionate about because I think that it's, the, um, it's not the future, it's the present. Actually, it's a very simple way to make a good diagnosis for our patients. Um, and it all starts with a simple Just step. The screen uh, it starts with using Share one software, one simple one, like PowerPoint. And with that, you have already started. So let's join next Tuesday uh, to speak about how we can do uh, cephalometric uh, measures and angles with uh, PowerPoint and with Keynote. Simple software that are available to all of us and uh, it's going to be great. So we will meet there and it's going to be fantastic. See you. Just a minute. Let me just. This is about uh, the webinar. I will share the link with everybody. And Dr. Jorge, it would be a pleasure if you can be our panelist on that day. It would Thank be an you. honor yes, for of us. Course. Yeah. Of course, of Thank course. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you for being a passionate listener. And uh, thank you, Dr. Jorge, for all your help. Uh, thanks again. Bye. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.